Will ethanol derived from corn help reduce our dependence on foreign oil? Many experts say yes, but only in the short term. There are long-term solutions for providing our transportation energy needs and for helping to beat prices at the pump. Rapidly growing grasses such as this miscanthus plant or algae can help provide a new generation of biofuel solutions and they offer the advantage of not requiring land that is desperately needed to grow food. Join us as scientists, business leaders, and economic experts from all over the world gather together at UC San Diego to discuss how biofuels will help meet our future transportation energy needs and also contribute to the mitigation of global warming. I chose this title very deliberately, Technology Isn't Enough. How much technology has looked so promising in the laboratory and then failed in the economic world of reality? And this is why Technology Isn't Enough is the title of my presentation. Now, here is a fundamental thing that many people refuse to believe. I deal a lot with farmers, ranchers, agriculture producers, agribusinesses in this country. And what's interesting is many of them believe that profitability is an accident. Prices are up, prices are down, crop conditions are good, crop conditions are bad. I make a profit or I don't make a profit by the roll of the dice. And too often, when people go into business or they look at technology and biofuels, they ask, well, you know, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. But it can't be an accident. It has to be a plan. And let's talk about, well, there was a great discussion yesterday talking about why lenders don't like to lend for biofuels facilities. We're talking about whether it's algae, switchgrass, or corn-based ethanol. And you can sum it up very easily. Those are typically single-use facilities with no alternative use whatsoever that rely on a government mandate. That's an extremely nerve-wracking type of investment to make because we know the government can be fickle. We know that markets can be fickle. And what's the next best use for an algae farm when you don't want to farm algae anymore? I'm trying to think about you know, alternative uses, and they're not very high value added. So therefore, as a banker, as an investor, I start getting very nervous, and I look for extremely high rates of return to compensate me for my risk. And I really want to know that you, as a person that wants to make a difference via bio biofuels, has a plan and you're not relying on profitability to repay this investment as an accident. Now, I apologize for this slide, but you have to do it once in a while. There's a lot up there, but the fundamentals of economics really never change. And economics are like gravity. Some people, even though they don't believe in them, still are affected by them. Some people actually believe in gravity. Now, the fundamental thing, and I'm gonna work under a strategy based on somebody called Michael Porter. Michael Porter is one of the premier competitive strategy people in the world. And he says, realistically, when you look at any business, any industry, it comes down to either one of two choices. Either you're gonna be the lowest cost provider of that good or service, or you're gonna be a differentiated provider of a good and service for a premium. There really is no middle ground and no acceptable mixed model between those two. If you're gonna provide a commodity-like service or product, you have to be the lowest cost provider of that product and service long-term to be successful. Because there's nothing that you're gonna be able to do to raise your price versus everybody else's price. Now, if you're doing Gucci handbags and you can convince people that a Gucci handbag is different than a Target handbag, then you're allowed to bump up price enormously because people are willing to pay it. Differentiated versus commodity. The first thing you must accept when you look at biofuels going forward is that it will be a commodity. Therefore, if it's a commodity, it has to be a low cost provider. There's no other alternative. Okay. Now, the next point is in business and in economics, there are two different elements. There's comparative advantage and competitive advantage. What's an example of comparative advantage? If I'm gonna grow biofuels, switch grasses, and I'm gonna grow on top of great soil with a long growing season with ample rain, that's a comparative advantage. Because I can grow a lot more dry matter than somebody who's gonna be stuck on poor soil in a very rain deficient area with very short growing season. 
So obviously one set of ground will produce much more dry matter for biofuels, and the other will be a lot less. And we're going to see that in a second about the impact. But the value of that comparative advantage will then be reflected in the value of the ground that's going to be producing the biofuel material. And so the question is, who captures the economic rent from the comparative advantage is the owner of the comparative advantage. Now, a competitive advantage is something different. Those are the infinite and myriad things that you do as a competitor different than everybody else that makes you more productive. And it's interesting. Comparative advantage is about good soil, right growing conditions. Competitive advantage is about Toyota. What makes Toyota, a company that was once bankrupt after World War II, now the largest car producer in the world, having just deplaced GM? What happened was they chose a model of continuous improvement and competitive advantage. Competitive, comparative. Now, the last point I want to make on this slide is there are three things that always get paid in every business. Capital, labor, and what I call intellectual smarts. So every business needs to pay for those three things. The question is, how much do you keep by the different categories? And it's very interesting because what people really want to do in a business is have management smarts, because that's really the net profit. When you look at competitive strategy, Michael Porter, and he wrote, the, he wrote a classic book. It is the cornerstone of competitive analysis in today's marketing world. Well, Michael Porter said there's five elements in competitive strategy that are fundamental. There's the supplier power, buyer power, inter-industry competitiveness, ability for new entrants, and substitutes. So I'm going to walk through these, because we're talking about food and fuel, fossil fuels and biofuels, and we're talking about the competitiveness of these elements together, because we want to know what's the long-term profitability. Now, it's interesting, yesterday we talked a little bit about the current outlook for corn-based ethanol. What you have here is a very interesting story of corn-based ethanol over the last eight years. The upper line here, the blue line, is the revenue on a per bushel basis. When you take a bushel of corn in today's market, you're basically fracturing it into two valuable elements. One of them is ethanol, and the other is a corn feed for animals, called distiller's dry grain for shorthand, DDG. Now, over the last eight years, I have tracked on a weekly basis the market price for ethanol and distiller's dry grain. If you take a 56 pound bushel of corn and break it down, typically you get 2.75 gallons of ethanol in a dry mill and 17 pounds of distiller's dried grain. So you know on a per bushel basis, by taking the prices of those elements, what it's worth. Now on the bottom, you have corn and natural gas. Here's another knock on current ethanol technology. It's very energy intensive for both heating the mash to get it to ferment and also heating the mash afterwards to dry it down to make it more storable for long-term usage. So natural gas is one of the major elements in making corn-based ethanol today. But take a look there. You can see an industry. Look at what we call the commodity trap. You have two somewhat unrelated elements, energy and the input price. Sometimes they make great profits. Sometimes the two lines come together. And when they come together, that means they're making literally no money. And then in 2006, look at what happened. The reason I think we're having this talk today is that in 2006, we had an initiative to expand biofuels use, and we also had a very subtle thing happen. In the auctionate market in the United States, which improves gasoline, we phased out a competitor for ethanol. That ethanol, that competitor is called MTBE. It's a natural gas-based fuel additive. It might be carcinogenic, and it also does not decay naturally in the water supply. So the EPA literally said, if you want to use it, you're going to be open to litigation going forward. And every fuel blender in the United States said, we don't like litigation. We don't like having to have lawyers on top of us like it's asbestos day. So what they're going to do is they backed out. But they backed out all at once. This was not a carefully planned phase out of this commodity. It was a sudden retreat from the market, leaving a huge gap. To meet that gap, there was a sudden importation of Brazilian ethanol and an immense run-up in the spot price of U.S.-based ethanol. In 2006, they were generating close to $11 per bushel of revenue at that time. And yet, the price of corn and natural gas was still around $3 a bushel for processing. The money was literally obscene. It was absolutely mind-boggling. 
Everybody from New York to California said, let's build ethanol plants. And it happens that way. And what happens is not that the price and the revenue of, of ethanol has really declined because we have $90 barrel crude oil, but look at what's happened to the price of corn. The price of corn going from using 4 or 5% of corn for ethanol to going to 25% in 2007, 2008 has shot up. It's doubled. So they've really squeezed out the profits. In, in economics, this is pure, purely to be expected. Where there are excessive profits, you will expand your supply sufficiently to squeeze those profits out, unless there's barriers to entry. And so the question is, how much long-term profit is there in biofuels? This is a great example of the fact that you have a commodity output and commodity input, and that long-term, you should not expect to have good returns and good business profits unless you do something differently than the rest of the people in your industry. Commodity trap. This is what biofuels will always be dealing with. It's going to be a commodity business that's going to have to have this mentality of working. Now, let's run through the elements. Seller power. When you look at the ability of somebody to look at your business, they say, aha, you're making money. I'm going to raise the price of my inputs to you so that I can extract some money from you to myself. They're looking at what's on the table, and they're going to grab what they can get. The question is, can they grab it? What controls that process of them getting their hands into that pile of profits that they're seeing on there? Well, there's a number of elements. Are there substitutes? How important is the seller to the buyer? You know, can they switch easily? Is there margin information? Do they even know how much money's on the table? You know, those are things that you need to know. But when you look at a business model involving biofuels, you need to analyze that and say, who's going to have the upper hand based on these different criteria? Now, if you look in the mirror, what you have then is you have the purchaser's power. The ability for people that you sell to to reach onto the table and take money off the table as well. And what you see is it's very similar to the buyer's, the seller's power. It's almost a mirror image because when you think about it, it really is just a flipping of the relationship. When you're looking at somebody else, you're trying to say, well, I'm selling something of value to them. Can I raise my price? Will they pay it? Vice versa, when you buy something from somebody, you're saying, well, can I no negotiate them down because they need me more than I need them? So it's always this mirror image going on. And so in a commodity business, it's very difficult because oftentimes the person in the middle has very little ability to defend themselves from either the buyers or the sellers. And so profits are really very difficult to be stable. Now, I've color-coded this one to kind of help us here. This is the inter-industry competitiveness. Certain industries are notorious for being their competitiveness. Airlines, for example, they fight endless battles for market share. There's reasons why, but every industry has a rationale for why some are much more competitive amongst themselves than others. Let's talk about biofuels for a second. What do we see going forward in biofuels? Will there be any brand? Probably not. You won't be able to tell a consumer, you should pay more for my biobutanol because it's, you know, San Diego-based biobutanol. What are they going to care? They really don't care. How about differentiation? By definition, if you're going to sell ethanol, biobutanol, or some other biofuels, you cannot be differentiated. Because if it's differentiated, then it's not going to meet the specifications for that commodity. And so it's got a problem there. Here where we get some interesting things. What about learning? This is the key. Let's go back and talk about Toyota for a second. Toyota knows how to learn. In fact, it's part of their cultural DNA. They have a lot of wonderful things. There's a wonderful, wonderful book out by a guy by the name of Liker, and he wrote The Toyota Way. It's worth reading, even for scientists. Because it's amazing how Toyota dedicated themselves to building up this learning attitude, this continuous improvement environment, this lean manufacturing. And part of it's go see, go learn. That's part of the fundamental thing of Toyota. Go learn, go see. So scales of learning. In a rapidly evolving technological environment, learning is a key to out-competing your competitors. Because if things keep changing and they don't want to learn, they keep falling further further behind. So by learning, you do better. Proprietary technology, truly a key. It's a very difficult thing to have proprietary technology without strong intellectual property patents around it. In Biofuse today, we have a company called Poet. Poet used to be called Broin out of South Dakota. 
Poet has made a very strong emphasis of developing pri proprietary technology. They're always trying some new and different things. We also have Fagan Engineering out of um, um, Granite Falls, Minnesota. They're also a premier developer and tinkerer in corn-based ethanol. What you might see happen in biofuels is an emergence of a similar company. Somebody who just keeps tinkering and building and IPing all sorts of wonderful technology that has a big impact. They might be extremely profitable even though they're not really in the biofuels industry themselves because they'll be selling that technology. Economies of scale. I think, and this is a personal analysis, that economies of scale are overrated and very weak in biofuels. You see a real desire for people to build big, big plants because what they say is, aha, if I have a $150,000 a year plant manager, salary, overhead, and bonus, and I have a 100 million gallon plant, I can figure out what's his contribution on a per gallon basis. But if I double the plant to 200 million, 200 million gallons, keep his salary the same, then his cost per gallon drops in half. And it gets to be a very tempting and tantalizing approach. But cost accounts are probably the worst thing to have in your company sometimes because they'll drive you into bankruptcy saving you money. And that's really what you have to be careful about. Here's a key, biotechnology. Favorable access to raw materials. Comparative advantage. Do you just have better access to raw materials than all your competitors going forward? And here's one, barriers to entry. A single use facility with no alternative use is very, very difficult. Now, what about you know, access to raw materials? I said it's key. When you look at that, it really is gonna be key, and the question is, where's the best place to locate for your technology? To be productive, you need to have the same three things. You need to have good soil, you need to have sufficient growing days, and you need to have water. You can't have soil and growing days and no water. You can't grow bio crops there. You can't grow anything there. You can't have, you know, all those except one. You need to have all three in order to be competitive. So where do we find these combinations? This is from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. They commissioned a study on land use change. And what this plate is trying to tell you is they looked around the world for the combination of all those factors that are crucial to growing row crops. And here's the point. The point is, if you're talking about growing cellulosic crops, you're also talking about growing row crops. Because any ground that is good for growing cellulosic would be good for growing row crops. For example, we often hear in the United States, let's look at the Dakotas, let's look at Kansas, let's look at Montana as sources for cellulosic growth. But why would the United Nations study find those plain states being somewhat unsuitable for row crops and therefore probably also being somewhat unsuitable for cellulosic crops? Rainfall, inconsistent, and soil types, not that good. So where you see the green, if you were to plant cellulosic to develop dry matter, those would be the very best places to be planting them. But guess what? What are we growing there right now anyways? Corn and soybeans. Because we know those are the highest and most productive spots. Now they have analysis for cellulosic in terms of forestry. Down in the southeastern part of the United States, they're more forestry oriented. So they look at this and say, this is where it is. So we know where the comparative advantage is. The question is, if we're growing row crops there, what would you have to pay them to get those row crops to give up that soil to grow cellulosic? Who else has good soil? Well, the Brazilians have great, they don't have great soil. Here, that's the thing. They have good growing conditions. They have long growing seasons and they have consistent rain. But traditionally, what has kept the Brazilians from being an agricultural exporter of the magnitude they're growing into? It was they had very poor soil types on a traditional basis. Now, they're learning to overcome that. So you have a lot of development area that would be available in some of these areas. But we know where the competitive advantage is. We know where the comparative advantage is. And if it's already a comparative advantage for growing row crops, to get cellulosic to take their place, they need to give people more money. Now, what about barriers to exit? Now, it's, it's interesting, because when you look at barriers to getting into a business, there's also barriers to get out of a business. So this, this, this quadrant's a little bit complicated. I'm not gonna dwell on it too much. But it asks, if you have exit barriers from low to high and you have entry barriers low to high, what's the impact on expected margins, profitability, and the stability of those margins? Now, the very best thing to have is a business that's very difficult to get into and very easy to get out of. Why is that? 
Because when there's profits, you won't suddenly get a new influx of competitors because there's barriers for them to get into your business. But when the profits go away, the worst of them will immediately exit and get you back to profits rather quickly. What's the very worst type of situation to be in? Where it's easy to get into a business but hard to get out. And so we have these combinations, and the question is, where is biofuels? And I would submit to you that biofuels, unfortunately, is in the Roach Motel quadrant of, of, of the economic analysis. Because when you talk to a person in this audience and you say, we need to raise $300 million to build an ethanol plant, does that sound like a lot of money? And the answer is, yeah, it sounds like a lot of money. But you call somebody up in New York, or you call somebody at Exxon Mobil, or ask somebody at those places, we need $300 million to build a facility, and they say, yeah, okay, I have the check. Where do you want it sent? You know, think about it. The Thunder Horse platform out in the Gulf of Mexico, which is just coming online, was a $2.5 billion platform. $2.5 billion. Single oil extraction platform, $2.5 billion. On average, we spend about $100 million, easy math, for an ethanol facility. That's like 25 ethanol facilities in a single location. Why did ExxonMobil, British Petroleum, decide to spend that kind of money? Because if they can extract 200,000 barrels of oil a day from that platform at $80 a barrel, it's easy money. So money is not really a barrier for big business. They can get together in short order if they think they're going to make money. Now, what about new entrants? What will keep them out? You know, access to raw materials? Not really a, a big barrier because you can locate right next to materials even if there's an existing competitor. Regulatory barriers, a little bit. Building facilities often involves a lot of regulatory barriers, different in California than, say, in Texas. Um, economies of scale. For big companies, economies of scale aren't a problem. They can get up to scale very quickly if they see money. Brand and differentiation, not really a problem in ethanol or biofuels. Capital cost, depends. If there's profits to be made, they can raise capital in very short order. Now. How about substitutes? I think this might be one of the most key things I have to say today. What about the substitutes? What are my biggest concerns when you look at biofuels? Periods of cheap crude oil. We will go through periods of cheap crude oil at some point. We always have. So when somebody tells you that we're going to have high-priced crude oil going forward, yes, they could very well be right. But that doesn't mean that you're not going to go through periods of cheap crude oil that could absolutely devastate biofuels producers. How about improved fuel consumption? By calling for an increase in the CAFE regulation, what you're doing is pushing back against biofuels. You're pushing against all fuels, but if biofuels are going to become a bigger component, you're also pushing back against them because they operate in the same environment. Mass transit. I ride the bus to work. Why? Because parking in downtown Minneapolis is hard to get and way too expensive. But I also don't use much fuel. Mass transit is a substitute for fuel consumption. We like it. We think it's a good thing. I am very much a proponent of it. But it's also something that's going to hurt biofuels demand. How about new feedstocks? This is what you're talking about here in, in great detail. LGs, other alternative uses of cellulosic. You know, right now when I talk to the corn guys, they're really struggling with this because they haven't seen it. They can't believe it. But I tell them it's coming. Foreign suppliers. U.S. biofuels is not the same as global biofuels. The Brazilians have access to a lot cheaper ground, cheaper labor, longer growing seasons with more regular rain than we do. Therefore, they can produce sugarcane-based biofuels much cheaper than we can produce anything in our country right now. And if we didn't have a 54 cent a gallon tariff on foreign biofuels, ethanol, we would see this market be inundated by Brazilian ethanol. How about the great unknown? There's always something out there we're not aware of. Take a look here. We measure miles driven on our highway system, road system in the United States. This is from the Department of Transportation. And take a look at the long-term growth rate from 1997 to 2007. I broke this out into two-year increments. From 97 to 1999, we rose 119 billion miles of driving. From 1999 to 2001, we went up 110 billion miles. From 2001 to 2003, through a recession, we went up 102 billion miles. From 1993 to 2005, we went up 105 billion miles. However, from 2005 to 2007, we've gone up 3 billion miles. What accounts for this pronounced and dramatic plateau 
and driving miles in the United States. It's very obvious, high price fuel. High price fuel has sent a signal to the consumers, don't drive any more miles. Now they haven't gone backwards, but they really haven't grown. And consistently over two year periods, they went up 100 billion miles over the last four periods, and it's been going on that way for a long ways. What this says is that you can substitute out demand by not driving as much. And if we go into recession, and this starts to decline, it will push back against both gasoline and biofuels. So it will have an impact. Can you even recognize your competition? This is a beautiful car. It's a very expensive one. It's the new FCX from Honda. It's a hydrogen-based car. They're going to start leasing it here in LA during the summer of 2008. They're going to have a distribution system. It can go, I think, 250 miles on a gas charge. It drives like a Honda Civic. A lot of people in this room probably drive Honda Civics. Does that look like your competition? But what about new battery technology? What about all sorts of other things that are sitting out there in other laboratories right now that we don't know about? What if they do develop hydrogen distribution and hydrogen production at a relatively cheap basis? You already have an example of someone who's thinking that way. So the point is here, substitutes. A lot of times we argue about whether it's going to be corn-based ethanol or cellulosic-based ethanol or algae-based ethanol, and there's somebody out there trying to push the whole thing right off the table to make it a non-issue. There's a hydrogen car. So let me finish up here by saying just a couple of things. Time is of the essence. If biofuels are going to be in the mix, they have to be going very quickly. We have to get going because there's a lot of other technology out there that's trying to have the market share of transportation. You know, the longer we wait, the more likely we're going to see. What's my strategy? What, would, what should the industry do? Grandiose plans are good, but allowing a system to build on itself is better. One of the biggest problems I have is that we ignore the Brazilians. The Brazilians have been using biofuels for over 30 years in very strong concentrations. But the Brazilians do something that's very, very smart. Each year, they look at the amount of sugarcane planted, and they take an estimate of how much sugarcane is going to be produced. Then they look at world sugar prices, they look at world crude oil prices, and they say, what's going to give us a good return on our money? In years where sugar prices are high and crude oil prices are low, they push more sugarcane towards sugar by reducing the incentive to use ethanol. And in years when crude oil prices are high, and sugar prices are low, they increase the incentive to use ethanol and push more sugarcane towards ethanol. So what they do is they have a built-in regulatory me me mechanism that allows them to avoid this food versus fuel crisis on an ongoing basis. Because if you just make a government mandate that says you must have this much biofuels and you don't have an alternative source, you're going to have a food versus fuel debate because there's no market subtlety. And we haven't seen any subtlety from our government. So economics never change. Biofuels will always be a commodity, so you need to be a low-cost producer. You've got to control one of these three things, capital, labor, or the intellectual property, if you're going to be somebody who benefits by being involved in this business. And you better know your true competitors, because they might not be who you think they are. Mm -hmm.